Chapter 12, The Bully Slayer As the two strode on, Michael started regarding Gabe. He gazed at him with a sense of nostalgia and began to sense, to see him as an embodiment of another time, of things how they used to be. Shit, so this is what's left of the bloody shamrocks, huh? Just you and me now. We were always just a ragtag group, but I liked it that way, and now you wouldn't even want any part of it. Michael began to entertain that sense of abandonment, which both depressed him and prided him at the same time. There was something bittersweet and poetic Michael felt about being the last one of his kind, willing to toughen it out after the bombs had fallen, and go at it out alone, wandering the wastes. Wandering the wastes? <laughs> Okay, I'm no Mad Max here, but still kind of curious now what the rest of the crew has been up to. That seemed to Michael as a good place to start a conversation. Hey, Gabe, what have happened to the rest of the crew? Gabe paused a second to reflect, then looked at Michael and felt reluctant to delve into the matter, knowing that Michael wasn't really curious about where their whereabouts were. Instead, he just wanted to hear how they had abandoned him and his colors. For Gabe knew Michael, he knew him that well. Back in those days in Coney Island, Michael had been the one that had started the creed. He was their pride and symbol, so Gabe knew just how much it must have disheartened him to see the bloody shamrocks disband after he went to prison. Without Michael, there never would have been a bloody shamrocks because Michael was just that much of the figurehead and the embodiment of it. All started back when they were really young kids. They had all been drawn to him because they couldn't believe just how headstrong he was. Michael had been eventually expelled from school, all because he couldn't stop getting into fights with other kids. The furthest he ever went to was like the ninth grade, and after that his father had talked to an old buddy of his, Fred Charnick, to come work for him in his garage while his wife tried to homeschool him the rest of the way. Try it is the word. Now, the reason the rest of the crew admired him back then the most wasn't because of how stupidly rompous pompous he was, a cocky asshole he was, but a cocky asshole when dealing with other cocky assholes, mostly. Michael saw no heart in beating up the weak to get some kicks. He found it quite despicable, actually, but he did find a lot of heart in beating up the rest. Michael was a bully slayer. Michael's pride and joy was beating up the ever-loving shit out of the strong that would like to beat the ever-loving shit out of the weak. It was also all about testing his might. If you were to look into Mad Boy's eyes when he was sitting on top of some punk kid while pummeling his face in, he looked like a kid that had crowned himself the king of the block. Most of the bloody shamrocks were kids that looked up to him like Sad Boy or kids Michael had initiated by shoving his foot up his ass and had them sent home crying to their mothers, Rad Boy. Mad Boy was an alpha type through and through who had become a mecca for all the betas around the block and other alphas that couldn't match his left and right. But funny thing was, Dot gave this time. As tough as he was back when we were kids, he never looked apart. I think we were like in 6th grade and 12 at the time, and it was around... Then, when we first noticed this scrawny-looking kid with curly hair and dimples and who never said much, but always had an innocent smile about him, the type you'd expect from a normal, happy kid his age, he really seemed like more of the type that should have been getting bullied, let alone being as he is, able to take them on and beat them in their own game. I mean, Mag Michael looked like a bigger twerp at the time than I did. And if you ever saw how I looked, then, well... It really boggled our minds to one day see him suddenly drop that smile in a heartbeat and become all enraged like some nutcase would. First time I saw him beat someone up, he took out one really big freckled kid, a green-eyed Italian kid, which everyone was afraid of. He was at least three times as big as Michael, and on the outside, seeing how's how Michael looked, none of us were expecting much. Ten times out of ten, anyone that had any sense about them would have placed money on the Italian kid. It had to have been that much of a given, but Michael turned out to be a colossal upset no one would have ever expected. And if that wasn't enough, it was what happened next that made Michael into a legend. Yeah, a legend. That big, fat, freckled kid had an older brother. That was part of some old outfit, which the name escapes... Oh, I remember. The Jets. Really old New York gang, really old. And they were, you know, they were greasers, too. But anyways, his older brother 
had to be 20 years old at the time at least, and when he found out how his little brother had been beaten up by this scrawny little twerp, he decided to go to his aid and put Michael in his place. Now, can you imagine a 12-year-old kid being able to beat up a grown adult? Well, no one else would have either, but it happened. After school, that guy grabbed Michael and pulled a knife on him and didn't expect much, seeing how he was only dealing with a child. Looked like he wanted to scare him a bit and maybe rough him up some. But it was no doubt surprised to see what happened next, as so were the rest of us. Michael headbutted him. And in a minute later, here was this kid sitting on the chest of a grown-ass adult beating the crap out of him. I mean, I've never seen anyone more humiliated in my entire life, and I've never seen a kid like Michael move as fast as he did to do all that humiliating. I mean, you don't see shit like that, and how could you ever expect it? Michael really made a name for himself that day as that other guy turned into the laughing stock all over Coney Island. Gabe had once asked Michael why he was the way he was and how he had become so inclined to let his fists to do all the talking. Michael's answer was that his father had made him that way. Your dad would beat your ass or something? Gabe had asked. Every fucking day, Michael had answered. Why, what you do to get that? Nothing, he would just beat me for the sake of beating me. This had disturbed Gabe to hear, but then Michael had noticed, and Michael then responded. Well, he wasn't like that, he just wanted to toughen me up. He wasn't out to straight up injure or kill me. Although one time he did go too far and broke my nose in when I was a kid. Broke a two of my ribs and really fucked me up good I, all around. Michael's father, Robert Redboy Conley, was some old war hero from WW2. A man of true grit and steel. A fucking marine sergeant. A man that had come back from the war and had started his own motorcycle club of Hells Angels in LA back in the late 40s also called the Bloody Shamrocks, or the good old Bloody Shamrocks, as Michael referred to them. So that's where you got the name, Gabe had asked. Yeah, Michael had answered. Uh, he beat your ass every fucking day, Gabe had asked again. Gabe, lay off. He wasn't a cool man. It's like John Wayne movies. Punching people in the face was just another way to say hello. Michael responded. A second passed. The fucking hard ass, Michael had concluded with a ten-ton frown. Another second. John Wayne movies, Gabe had asked. Yeah, John Wayne movies, Michael had concluded. Uh, ever watch them? My dad used to take me to see them in the 60s, and the first thing you'd see John Wayne do was punch some guy in the face. <laughs> Next scene, he'd punch another guy in the face. You'd watch another movie, punch in the face. Next movie, punch in the face again. I'm guessing you can see a reoccurring theme here, right? Well, movie after movie, that's all you see him do. First act, him punching. Second act. Although shit would get serious when some barman would punch him right back, which would lead to the third act of John Ganny really mad and knocking the dude's dick in the dirt. <laughs> Roll credits. And it didn't matter who he was punching, the bad guy, his best friend, some corrupt business type, or some hobo down on his luck. He'd punch them anyways and then buy them a drink later. That would get overly emotional around women and yell at them because you love them and didn't know how to show it. But anyways, through all that punching somehow, he became like the number one icon of everyone in my dad's generation. Go figure. Gabe had then stood there, shrugged it off, and then felt like he had a new sense of appreciation for his own old man and how he was nothing like that. Although, funny thing though, <laughs> if you had ever watched Jimmy Cagney movies, you sort of see the same thing, but done to make him the most iconic bad guy in film. And what would he do to get that? Put his hands on women. <laughs> First act, he smacked the taste out of some woman for no good reason. Second act, do it again, but then shove her down and kick her while she's down there. Final act, this time the unlucky Dane would have something for him and would tell him off how she had two-timed him. And then Jimmy would just shoot the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so much violence, so much violence, and always towards women. And that's how he became like the most hated and the most beloved man also on screen. <laughs> now back to John Wayne and of that heinous putting hands on women crap. <laughs> I fucking love the movie North to Alaska. Nothing but him and a bunch of rowdy varmints just getting drunk and silly and beating the fuck out of each other for like two hours straight. Then him yelling at some lovely French whore and the movie ends with I love you. And that was it. No need for some overly complicated plot to tell a story. I don't know. 
I like simplicity like that, Michael had brought up. But then Gabe thought about what Michael had just said about John Wayne being overly emotional, and knowing Michael, he felt like pressing on that matter. You like John Wayne movies? Gabe had asked. Yeah, why? Overly emotional, you say? Gabe had asked again. Yeah, what about it? That's how a lot of people in my dad's generation were, even when being tough guys. None of this overly stoic bullshit you see now, Michael had responded, seeming somewhat pissed. Well, like Clint Eastwood, Gabe had followed up. Michael then sneered, You don't like him? No, I like his movies. I think he's pretty cool. I'd punch him in the face, but what? Gabe had asked. Nothing. I just like characters that got hard and ain't af afraid to say what they feel, Michael had commented. Gabe seemed intrigued. Not a lot of guys would think that way anymore, Gabe had commented back. Yeah, that's because they got no heart. They think being cold-blooded and expressionless as dry ice is what's tough. And you know, I know, with some guys around, if you say the word emotional, they'll take you for being a fag and laugh. Well, you know what? Let them say that to me in my face. When I have them crying like a little girl, which I always do, then we'll see who gets emotional. Michael has responded and seemed even more pissed. Gabe had then cringed as he saw the fire building up in Michael's face and then felt like he should probably detach. Gotta say, Gabe, you should experience it sometime. You bump into some macho asshole that thinks he's tougher and better than you, and then when he tries to give you shit, you knock him the fuck down, then sit on his chest and start wailing on him until he drops a tough guy act and starts bawling. The shit feels like heaven. Michael had then finally concluded. Gabe then stood there as he watched Michael continue to burn some more. He then saw him take out his old mother's old rosary, kiss the crucifix, and then watched him leave as his fire subsided.